consider myself a professional counselor. I'm certainly not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but as a pastor, I have done a lot of counseling. I've counseled people who have been through hurt. I've counseled people as they prepare to get married. I've counseled people that are having struggles in their marriage. I've counseled a whole host of different people facing a whole host of different problems. And what I've learned in the counseling that I've done, what I've learned in my own life That unless a person does two things, they will never experience emotional wholeness. They can do a lot of things, but if they don't do these two things, they will never be emotionally whole. One is that they take responsibility for their actions. You cannot keep blaming people for who you are today. We've all been hurt. We've all been let down. We've all been influenced by different people in our life, but at some point in your life, you have to take responsibility for who you are and how you currently are living. You can't keep blaming someone for who you are and for your actions, and if you don't do that, you'll never be emotionally whole. And then the second thing that I've learned that you must do, you must forgive the people who have hurt you. You must forgive the people who have wronged you. So if you don't do those two things, if you keep blaming people for who you are today and you keep holding grudges and resentments in your heart, you will never be emotionally whole. You will never be spiritually whole and you'll never have the relationship with God that he wants you to have. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about that second one, the need to forgive the people in our life who have wronged us. And we're going to look at the story of Joseph. We've been talking about Joseph the last couple of weeks. Hopefully you have been here for those messages. We're going to culminate today with how Joseph forgave his brothers, these brothers who wronged him, these brothers who sold him into slavery. We're going to talk about Joseph today and his forgiveness. So go ahead and take your Bible and turn over to Genesis chapter 45, and I want to read the first 15 verses. Now, in case you weren't here the last couple of weeks, let me kind of set the stage for you. So when Joseph was 17 years of age, his brothers sold him into slavery. He was a privileged young man. He was favored by his father, Jacob. Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons, and he didn't even try to hide it. And he gave him this coat of many colors, this long sleeve robe, this beautiful robe, whatever type of robe it was. It was a special robe that he gave Joseph, and his brothers were jealous of him. And also, God gave Joseph these dreams that one day you're going to be a leader. And even your brothers and your mother and your father are all going to come and bow down to you. And and he shared those dreams with his brothers. Probably shouldn't have done that, but he did. And they hated him. And one day an opportune time came about and they sold Joseph into slavery. And he was taken down to Egypt. And there he was purchased by a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar saw that God was with Joseph and he entrusted him with leadership over all his household. But Joseph was a well-built and handsome man, the Bible says. And Potiphar's wife began to lust after him and began to plead with him that she basically said, come and sleep with me. And he resisted and finally he ran from her and left his garment and he And she falsely accused him of attempted rape. And Potiphar had him thrown into prison. And and, and while he was in prison, again, the warden recognized God was with him and gave him leadership over the other prisoners. And and, and there came into the prison the cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh, and he interpreted these dreams for them. And then eventually Pharaoh himself had these dreams He didn't know what they meant. 
And the cupbearer said, well, there's a man that interpreted my dreams and they came true. I bet he can interpret your dreams as well. So they went and they got Joseph and they brought him to Pharaoh and Pharaoh shared his dreams. And sure enough, Joseph interpreted the dreams correctly. And therefore, Pharaoh exalted him as second in command over all of Egypt. Because these dreams were, you're going to have seven years of abundance. I mean, your crops, just so much abundance, you won't know what to do with it. Followed by seven years of severe famine. And Joseph said, that's what your dreams mean. And you need to have someone overseeing it, getting it ready, storing up crops. He said, I believe you're the man. And he exalted him. And then the famine not only was in Egypt, but it was in Israel and all around that region. And so Jacob, he, he sent his brothers down to Egypt and said, you've got to go and you've got to buy grain from Egypt. And they came down. They didn't recognize Joseph. Joseph recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And he had been interacting with them and even testing them. But he comes to the place in this story I'm going to read today, where, where he finally reveals himself to them. He finally he just says, hey, I'm Joseph. And he forgives them from his heart. It's a powerful story. Look with me. Uh, Genesis chapter 45, beginning with verse 1. Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of all his attendants. So he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and also Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. And they came near. I am Joseph, your brother, he said, the one you sold into Egypt. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here, because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Return quickly to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. You can settle in the land of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all you have. There I will sustain you, for there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you, your household, and everything you have will become destitute. Look. Your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin can see that I'm the one speaking to you. Tell my father about all my glory in Egypt and about all you have seen and bring my father here quickly. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his shoulder. Joseph kissed each of his brothers as he wept, and afterward his brothers talked with him. Now, that is a powerful story about forgiveness. And again, if you're going to be emotionally whole in your life, you got to do two things. You can't blame people. You have to eventually take responsibility for your own actions, but also you have to forgive the people who have wronged you. And in this story, we see that Joseph, from his heart, forgave his brothers And as we go through this story today, I want you to think about your own life. And you know, even something may resurface in your life, something you've never really dealt with, because our family can be sometimes the people that hurt us the most. 
And if we don't forgive them, if we don't let it go, if we don't, so to speak, move on with our life, we will never be emotionally and spiritually whole. So let's talk about forgiveness. I want to point out a couple of things that Joseph did. And these are things that you need to do and I need to do if we're truly going to practice forgiveness. The first thing that Joseph did, Joseph refused to hold in the hurt any longer. He decided to let it out. He had held in this hurt a long time. You see, when Joseph was sold into slavery, he was 17 years of age. When he was released from prison and elevated by Pharaoh to be second in command, he was 30 years of age. And when he revealed himself to his brothers, he was 39 years old, already had seven years of abundance and now two years of famine. So 17 years of age when he was sold into slavery, 39 years old in this story. He had been carrying this hurt and carrying this pain for 22 years. And now he's coming to the place where he's letting it go, where he is basically experiencing this emotional release. In in Genesis chapter 42 and verse 21, the brothers are talking among themselves, and, and this is what they say. Obviously, we are being punished for what we did to our brother We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but we would not listen. They remembered the deep distress, but so did Joseph. You see, they they threw him into a pit, and then the Ishmaelites came along, and, and they sold him into slavery, and here it talks about that deep distress, and even he was pleading with them, please don't do this to me, I'm your brother. But they did it anyway. They were cold-hearted and callous. And he had been carrying this for 22 years. You know, some people say time heals all wounds. I don't think that's really true. I don't think time heals all wounds. I think God heals all wounds. And some some wounds can fester... And can get worse with time. So if you think, well, I'm just going to bury it. I'm going to ignore it. I'm just going to brush it under the carpet, under the rug, and everything will be okay. Time will heal all wounds. It doesn't happen that way. God is the one who has to heal the wounds of your heart. Think about the major trauma that Joseph faced in his life. He was kidnapped, he was sold into slavery, he was falsely accused of rape, and then he was thrown into prison. Now, any one of those would have been sufficient to say that you have been through major trauma in your life, and he went through all of that. He faced a lot of trauma in his life, but but he chose not to hold in the hurt any longer. He chose not to, to hold in the pain any longer. And one of the common refrains that you see in the Joseph narrative is this, he wept. Over and over again, it says, he wept. When he heard his brothers talking about how they had betrayed him, he wept. When he saw his, his brother Benjamin, he wept. When he made himself known to his brothers, he wept. When he embraced them, he wept. When he was reunited with his father, he wept. When his brothers feared that he would still hold a grudge, he wept. You see this over and over again. If you read through the Joseph narrative, it just keeps saying, he wept, he wept, he wept. And I'm not, I don't think this is saying he was just an emotional guy. You know, some people weep at the drop of a hat. You've probably been around people like that. They're crying all the time, and nothing wrong with that. I don't think this is saying that, hey, Joseph was just this emotional guy. I think he had held in this hurt and this pain and this trauma for so long, and he's finally facing it, and it's just, you know, just being released out of his heart. He's just weeping. Have you ever sobbed uncontrollably? 
I remember a, a time in my life when I had to face a hurt from my past. And as I, have, as I faced that, I just sobbed uncontrollably. I couldn't quit crying. It, it was just so deep, and the pain was so deep in my heart and in my life. And I think that's kind of what Joseph was going through. You see, forgiveness can be painful and emotionally draining, but it can also be emotionally liberating to release that pain and release that hurt. Some say time heals all wounds. No, it, time doesn't. And you you may even today know of hurt in your life. And and even right now, you're in a mental battle because you don't want to think about it. You don't want to face it. I'm just going to keep suppressing it. I'm going to keep acting like it never happened. It did happen. And you can forgive that person by the grace of God. You see, forgiveness can be painful, but unforgiveness can also be painful. Unforgiveness is you choosing not to forgive the person who wronged you and to keep carrying that resentment so the person only hurts you one time. You're allowing them to hurt you over and over and over again, and you're giving them a power over your life. And you have to forgive. If you don't, it'll poison all of your relationships. It'll be like a cancer in your soul. There's no other option. You have to forgive. I think I've told you the story before about Corey Ten Boom. And she was a wonderful Christian lady. She and her family were arrested because they were hiding the Jewish people during the Nazi regime. And there in Holland, they were hiding Jewish people. And during the German occupation of Holland, they they were arrested. And, and Corey and her sister Betsy, uh, they were thrown in a concentration camp just like all the Jewish people were and treated just the same. And her, her sister Betsy died in a concentration camp. And if you've never read about the Jewish concentration camps, I'll tell you, it's a hard read. I mean, they treated those Jewish people worse than animals, unbelievably cruel to them. And she faced that. And so it's 1947, the war is over, and Nazi, and Nazi Germany has been defeated, and she goes back to Germany, and she is sharing the gospel, basically sharing her story of forgiveness in the basement of a church in Munich, Germany. And she's telling those folks who are there, she is saying, God will forgive you. God forgives us of all of our sins. And she said, God can take your sins and throw them into the depths of the ocean. And after she got done, the people began to file out except one man, an older man. And he walked up to her and she said, I immediately recognized him. He was one of the guards in the concentration camp where she and her sister were. And all of a sudden she said her heart just It was like her blood began to freeze where she could remember the pain and remember remember the cruelty. And he walked up to her and he reached out his hand and he said, I'm a Christian now. God has forgiven me, but I want to hear, do you forgive me too? You see, he didn't remember her, but she mentioned the concentration camp where she was housed And he worked there, so he didn't remember her, but he knew that he would have been there during her time. And he said, I want to hear it from you. And she said, she just froze. She said, I I just froze. She said, it was just a few seconds, but she said, it felt like hours. And she said, I couldn't do anything. She said, it was like my heart just became hardened. And I did not want to forgive this man. My sister died in that concentration camp. They treated us horribly. And this man thinks he can just come up and say, you know, do you forgive me? And I'm just supposed to forgive him? And then she remembered the words of Jesus. If you do not forgive men that trespass against you, then neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And so she prayed right there. 
She said, Jesus, help me. She's praying silently. Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. She said, Jesus, all I can do is lift my hand. You're going to have to do the rest. And she said when she lifted her hand and his hand embraced her hand, it was like the peace of God came over her. And she said she had an experience with the love of God like she had never had in her entire Christian life. She said it was the hardest thing she had ever done, but at that moment she experienced the love of God like she had never experienced in her entire life. And she said what I learned from that is you don't have to have the emotion at the at the beginning, it has to be an act of your will. I choose to forgive this person. I'll stretch out my hand, Jesus. You do the rest. Unforgiveness is not an option. You have to forgive. So don't hold in the hurt any longer. Well, a second thing that Joseph did, Joseph did not seek revenge. Now, the table was set for him. Brothers had wronged him. They had hurt him greatly. And now, he's second in command over all of Egypt. Now, the tables have turned, and they're coming to him. And they need him. And they're begging him for bread and grain. And they don't even know who he is. You're talking about the table set right there. He's in a place of supreme power. Pharaoh has given him jurisdiction over all of Egypt. He could have said, I want all of these men executed right now. He even, he tested them. You have to go back and read the story. I can't go over the whole narrative today. But he tested them and even said, you're spies. He could have even just went with that and said, hey, these men are spies. I don't trust them. I want them to be executed right now. He could have killed them all. He could have had his revenge. He could have had his moment right there. But he chose not to. He chose to forgive them instead and show them kindness. Look at Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, this is after Jacob has come down to Egypt and he's been reunited with his brother Joseph and now he's dead. And the brothers are afraid. Oh, no, dad is dead. What will Joseph do to us? It says, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, and I want you to really hear this, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. Notice the kindness could have sought revenge. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph said, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. Joseph knew he was not the judge. God is the judge. We are never to seek revenge. We are to pray for the forgiveness of those who wrong us. You see, vengeance is in the Lord's hand, and he will right all wrongs. And if someone has hurt you, and maybe they got away with it, and maybe they weren't even placed in jail for it, and they should have been, God sees all. And God will right every wrong. In Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, the apostle Paul says, 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, now let me tell you, this is not easy. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Probably the image of kind of shaming him so that he comes to repentance. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Joseph said, am I in the place of God? If you seek personal revenge, you think you're in the place of God. That's not your role and that's not your responsibility. That's God's role and that's God's responsibility and that's God's prerogative. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Our responsibility is not to seek revenge but to hurt the people or to forgive the people who have hurt us. Listen, if you keep bringing up what someone has done to you, if you keep talking about what someone has said about you or done to you or how they have hurt you, have you really forgiven that person? If you keep bringing it up, if you keep talking about it, if you keep stewing over it, you probably have not forgiven that person. It's kind of like the pastor. He was counseling the couple. And the young man said, Every time we get in an argument, my wife becomes historical. And the pastor said, I think you mean hysterical. He said, no, I mean historical. Because she brings up everything I've ever done wrong. Well, wives can become historical. Husbands can become historical. But have you really forgiven if you do that? Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Instead of seeking revenge, Joseph forgave them. He said, I'm not in the place of God. And he didn't seek revenge. He, He provided for their needs. He comforted them. He spoke kindly to them. E. Stanley Jones once said there are three levels of life. You can live on one of these three levels. The first level he calls the demonic level, and that's where you return evil for good. That's the demonic level. You return evil for good. Someone has done good to you, or maybe someone has never wronged you, and you hurt them for no reason. That's demonic. Returning evil for good. And then he says some live at the human level, and that's where they return evil for evil. So you stab, my, stab me in the back, I'm going to stab you in the back. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You wrong me, I'm going to wrong you. That's the human level. But then he said there's the Christian level where you return good for evil. Someone has wronged you, but you don't wrong them in return You do the opposite. You show kindness to them. What level are you living at? Are you living at the demonic level, simply the human level? Are you living at the Christian level where you return good for evil? And and one way that you show kindness to people who have wronged you is you pray for them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44, You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I'll tell you, as you do this, God will bless you. It'll help you to forgive, but also God will bless you. I'll tell you, it's hard at times to pray for people who have wronged you. A few weekends ago, it's been almost a month ago, we went to Pittsburgh. We took a weekend vacation, the family and I went to Pittsburgh, and on that Friday night, we went to a Pittsburgh Pirates game. They were playing the Reds, and the Reds actually won that night, so it was a great evening, but we got there early because we thought we might be able to get some autographs from the Reds players, and already were these men, these older men that were standing down there 
and they had, you know, basically their books open, they were selling these autographs. And they were down at the front, and no one else could get through. And behind are, the, are my children, and these men are just getting autograph after autograph, and the player would come and sign a bunch of autographs and leave the next player, and they would never move. And even some were saying, hey, let the kids through. And they said, no, we were here first. Now, I'll tell you, it was hard for me to pray for those guys. I was tempted to lay hands on them without prayer. And so Graham was teary-eyed, Savannah was teary-eyed, and, and um, you know, Allie kind of took it in stride, but they, they were hurt about that. And so, you know, you just go on. We enjoyed the game. I said, let's not let this ruin our night. We enjoyed the game. Well, recently, my wife put Graham in a drawing to be a red's head. I don't know if you know what that is. And he won. And so today, this afternoon, when the game starts, or actually before the game, Graham gets to go out on the field, run around the bases, meet one of the Reds players, and get a signed autographed baseball from him. We don't know who it is. I hope it's De La Cruz. <laughs> I'd like to make a little money myself. <laughs> But, you know, I was thinking about that, and it's, it's uncanny. Jenny's won two separate times Reds tickets this year. So if you want her to put your name in anything, just call her up. She has the Midas touch right now. But, you know, she called me and said, hey, I've won these tickets. You won't believe it. And Graham gets to go out on the field and meet one of the players and run around the bases. And I said, man, that's just really neat. God has favored and God has blessed. And it took me a little while, you know, to kind of connect the dots. And I shared last night in our devotional time, our Bible time, I said, you remember that night? And Savannah said, yes, I remember. <laughs> and I said, look how God has turned it around. I said, God saw those tears, and God saw that wrong. And now you're not just going to get an autograph. You're going out on the field and you're going to be able to run around the bases and get an autograph. Hey, you know, it's hard to pray for people who have wronged you. It's hard to press through it. But if you do, God will bless you. God will bless you. And it can be in many different ways, but God can bless you. If you forgive, God sees that forgiveness. God sees that act of kindness. And God's heart is touched by that forgiveness. And he will bless you. Well, one other thing that Joseph did, very, very important, and not just important in the area of forgiveness, but really all of life. Joseph saw God's higher purpose in what he had gone through. He saw the hand of God. Can you see the hand of God on your life? Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers, taken from his family, taken from his homeland, sold into slavery, falsely accused, thrown into prison. Yet the hand of God was on his life through it all. It kept saying, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. In every high and every low, every mountaintop, every valley, God was guiding his life. God had given him these dreams. He had a dream that uh, his sheep stood up and that all the other sheaves bowed down to his. And that even the, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down before him. Did it happen? Well, Genesis 42, verse 6 says, Joseph was in charge of the country. He sowed grain to all its people. His brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the ground. They didn't even know it was Joseph. Remember what they said? We'll see what becomes of his dreams. We're going to throw him into the pit. We're going to sell him into slavery. We'll see what comes of his dreams. And here they are right now bowing down. Don't even know it's him. Because if God gives you a dream, no one can destroy that dream. But you have to see God's higher purpose in it all. Go back to chapter 45. And 
And as I read a few of these verses from the chapter I read earlier, notice when, it, when he talks about God, and I'll try to emphasize it when I read it, verses 5 through 9. And now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves for selling me here because God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. For the famine has been the land these two years and there will be five more years without plowing or harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to establish you as a remnant within the land and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God He has made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Return quickly to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me without delay. God sent me here. You thought you were sending me here. God sent me here. Genesis 50 Verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What does Romans 8, 31 say? If God be for us, who can be against us? People can be against you, but they won't prevail against you. That's what that verse means. So if you think, well, if God is for me, no one will be against Well, no, there will be people at times against you. If God be for us, who can be against us? It means who can prevail against us? No one. Because God is on your side. You know, I don't know how you've been hurt or betrayed. And, and some hurt and betrayal is at such a tra- traumatic level. It is hard to forgive. But I wonder, has anyone went through the trauma that Joseph went through? I mean, he went through some major trauma. So I would say no matter what you've been through, if Joseph were here today, he could identify. Thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, and not by people he didn't know, his own flesh and blood. It always hurts worse when it's your family that hurts you. It always hurts worse. Falsely accused of rape, thrown into prison. Man, he faced major trauma in his life. But he saw the hand of God. God was leading. God was guiding. Romans 8, 28. That's the verse to me that sums up the Joseph narrative. If you just want one verse for the story of Joseph, it's Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, it doesn't say all things are good. Some things are horrible. It doesn't say all things are good. It says all things work together for good. And it doesn't even just say that. It's not like, well, this is true for everybody. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Those are the ones that God is directing their life and blessing their life. You see, Joseph saw God's higher purpose in his life. Can you see God's hand on your life? Even in the hurt that you've been through? Are you willing to forgive, not seek revenge, not hold in the hurt any longer, but release it into God's hands? You'll be free. Forgiveness is hard and forgiveness is painful, But unforgiveness is more painful. And don't let the person hurt you. They've already hurt you once. And and maybe they hurt you multiple times. But don't let them keep hurting you because you're not willing to forgive them. Well, in closing, let me just bring it back to Jesus. I think Joseph is a picture of Jesus And so much about the life of Joseph, you can connect it back to Jesus. Joseph had the power to seek revenge. Joseph had the power to execute his brothers. They bowed down before him. He could have said the word and they would have all been executed. In the same way, Jesus has the power to condemn you and to condemn me. And he has the right to do it. It's like the woman caught in adultery, thrown before Jesus. The law says stoner. Jesus had the right. Those other men did not have the right. 
He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. They all left because they had sin in their life. He had no sin in his life. He had the right to condemn her. He had the right to throw the stones, but he didn't. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And what about on the cross? Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The forgiveness of Jesus Christ, no matter what you have done wrong, you can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. You know, back to Corey Tim Boom, when she would talk about forgiveness, she would talk about how God would throw your sins into the depths of the sea. And then at times she would say, and then he'll put a sign, no fishing allowed. Don't try to get those sins back. Don't, you know, don't keep thinking about your past life and what you did wrong and feeling guilty over that. God has forgiven you. You are clean and pure and fully accepted in the sight of God. Live that way. But if he's forgiven us, we need to forgive others. It's, it's really, I don't, I don't want to be harsh, but it's really hypocritical if we're, if we're willing to receive the forgiveness of God. If we're willing to say, oh, I just appreciate how much you've forgiven me, God. I praise you for your great forgiveness. But then we won't forgive the people who have wronged us. We can't do that. If we receive God's forgiveness, we have to pass it on to others. And we have to forgive as 